in this county, there's uh, quite a few, uh, quite a few towns. The uh, the main one that we have would be San Luis. Uh, down uh, down south, we have uh, Garcia, Mesita, Haroso. Then you you move up to the east in the Culebra drainage, and you know you have San Francisco, you have uh, Chama, Los Fuertes, you have you have uh, uh, Corriera, you have little 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 towns, and then like I said, you have San Luis. To the north, uh, we have Blanca and Fort Garland, which uh, uh, take up the northern part of, of Costa Rica. You know the town. The town is, uh, was established uh, way back uh, in the 1850s uh, because there had been numerous uh, opportunities for people to come this way, but because of the hard winters, it was a rough place to be. So uh, they had come and tried to settle it once before, then had to go back to Santa Fe, and then they came back with a little bit more and actually settled in a place where, uh, if you look around San Luis. Uh, oldest town in Colorado you can look that uh, it's very very uh, easy to uh, uh, to find a life that's sustainable here and back in those days uh, winter wasn't as easy but uh, uh, you could always do enough during the summer to lay you over and it's still that way to this day. This was actually coined San Luis back in 1542. Coronado came, Francisco uh, de Coronado. He came uh, in 1542, and they believed that he actually got here on or about August 25th of 1542. August 25th is the feast day of St. Louis, um, or St. Louis, um, who was the king of France. So actually this area got its name from San Luis, Rey de Francia. And that was 200 years prior to actually somebody making a settlement here. For that much time, this place was actually known as San Luis. And then the rest of the valley was coined as El Valle de San Luis. One of the first things that people had to do in an establishment was to dig a ditch. Um, so that's where the acequias came in. Acequias are still the lifeblood of our area. Um, and it's because water is the lifeblood of our area. People wouldn't have even been able to actually stay here, even if they were granted, even if they were given land and, and animals. You couldn't stay here unless there was actually enough water to be able to sustain. You needed the water to grow the plants, which were the medicines and the um, vegetables, the fruits and the nuts that were here that they were able to use. That sustained their animals. The animals sustained the humans. Um, and, you know, it was really, they didn't need to be taught about forest health to know that those mountains were sacred, those mountains are what gave us life. In 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, but in 1847, one of the children of Carlos Bubian, his name was Narciso Bubian, and uh, Stephen Lee, who was his partner, were killed in the Taos Revolt. That was in 1847. That land grant was actually given to them, but was given back to Carlos, who was the dad. Um, and so it kind of changed hands because the initial grantees were actually killed in that, uh, in that Taos Revolt. Um, so prior to 1851, even before this came, became the first state, or I mean the first uh, establishment in Colorado, Bubian was sending people here to, you know, settle and to start their, their agricultural um, lands. So again, 1851, April 5th, is when the town was uh, dedicated. Um, although it had been an establishment well before that, um, it was built initially as what they called a placita. All of the other little placitas that were up uh, were actually named after the missions of the churches. So what did they do first? They built homes, which was how they kept themselves safe. They cut the waterways, which are the acequias that were able to water their um, their plants and animals, and then they built churches. So the churches that are all here are all specific names of saints who are really important. San Acasio got its name from a really uh, cool story as well. Back when San Luis was very young, uh, and that was a newer settlement back there, again, just west, 
still on the same creek. The story goes that the, the men were out in the fields one day and left the children and the women uh, back home. Another group of settlers who were there at that time saw this as their opportunity to go and make their attack on the Placita of San Acasio, and so they made their approach. When they were getting close to the plaza, the women and the children uh, were very afraid because uh, typically the men were the ones that would come to the aid as far as the uh, security was concerned, and they were all out in the fields. So the story goes that the women and the children prayed to St. Acacius, San Acasio, who is the patron saint of wars, of warriors. This great big cloud formed in the air, and they saw in this cloud what they believed was a Roman uh, soldier, and they got so afraid by seeing this incredible Roman soldier in the clouds that they decided that they were gonna turn back around and take off. And so they, because they prayed to San Acasio and he came to their aid, they said that they were gonna build a church there and that that was gonna be, you know, uh, dedicated to him. The town of San Luis was founded in 1851. Shortly after that, uh, 1852, is when, when La Vega was formed because they knew that that was going to be the case, that they needed to find some type of support. So uh, our ancestors knew enough that uh, uh, it needed to be uh, uh, kept close by to where they had access. That's what's interesting is that, uh, you know, uh, not too many things that were started in 1851 or 1852 uh, are still uh, being used to this day. And, you know, you, you look at this, it's, it's, uh, it's not overgrazed. It's uh, uh, well taken care of because we have descendants who care about our earth that are managing it. And to me, that's the important part is that, uh, that they care enough to manage it in a way to where it will be there for future generations. La Vega is a, is a, a, a commons, uh, uh, one of two, the Boston Commons is the only other one in the United States. Uh, this is the actual, and, and, and the one in Boston isn't that big, and I don't know how uh, active it actually is, but the commons that we have here are for communal use, for uh, when they had a small, uh, a small community like San Luis, uh, not everyone could have their cattle in their yard. So what they did was they came up with the, the uh, uh, acreage surrounding the town to where uh, people could bring their cows, they could bring their horses, and, uh, and they could actually uh, uh, sustain themselves by having uh, meat and, and, and their transportation when it came to the horses. Ever since I was young, uh, La Vega was a, a place where we went where, uh, as, as you can feel here now, a place of, of healing and peace. And uh, whenever people are, 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 uh, are down, whenever, uh, this is a place where, where a lot of us come. We come to the stream. We come to nature to uh, be able to uh, uh, take care of that. The only way that we can actually do this is going to be to honor the people who did it before us and try to teach the people who come after us how they did it. So we're the bridge, uh, and right now that's what we're doing, is we're building that bridge so that uh, we can take our history and move it into the future in a, in a sustainable way to where we don't lose who we are. Sangre Cristo land grant where we're sitting uh, was really split up into three different parts. So the one part was the Bada Strip, which was basically everything that was west of the mountains themselves all the way to the, um, to the Rio Grande. Two parts um, were given so that all peoples of the land grant were able to use in whatever fashion that they saw fit. Those were the Sierra. Uh, which is all of this mountain range, uh, our part of the San Luis Cristo Ranch or uh, San Luis Cristo Range that we can see, but specifically 80,000 acres that is just right up over here. Um, the second part of it was the Vega. So the Vega is actually this part back over here that we can see that the uh, Culebra Creek runs through. Vega in San Luis or Vega in Spanish rather is um, a marshland, and that very much is a Vega. It's a marshland. Um, 900 acres of the Vega were given so that people could bring their animals to graze. Um, and it is the original 
commons and one of only two commons in the United States that still exist. This is 900 acres. Our Vega is still used. We have a board that manages it, but all of this area here that you see that is grazable land, um, anybody who is a, an original um, inheritor of the land grant or anybody who owns property here now can take their animals in. They uh, have to have them in by May and out by October uh, because that's just really the, the best way to keep it uh, as healthy as you can. You don't want to overgraze it. You want to make sure that there's enough vegetation that grows back up the next year and everybody has to be able to actually take their animals somewhere else. One of the things that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo really promised, uh, or the three things I guess that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo promised, were uh, preservation of land, language, and culture, okay? Those were promised and at one time or another were really cherished, um, were sometimes taken away from people and sometimes given back, but the culture is one thing that can never be taken away from this place. If you look back over here on this side, the one piece that still has a little bit of uh, snow, it actually looks like maybe a parakeet or like a, a bird that's looking off this way. That is actually the Culebra watershed. Um, it's beautiful to see anything up there right now, but if you were here for as many generations as we were, you'd be a little afraid to see that bird right now at this time of year. We really shouldn't be able to see that. There should be a lot more snow up there and you really shouldn't be able to see that figure until about July. If we can already see it now in May, we know that there is not going to be enough water to be able to sustain us all the way through September and October when our growing season ends. A lot of things that affect that are the winds, most especially this year. You know, it's funny that we called that Ventero, which is the, the windy, uh, and Ventero Peak is actually one of the 14ers that's out over there. This is Culebra Peak that's back over here. Apparently it's been windy forever. Ventero is what they initially coined it as, right? The winds really help take that snow elsewhere. Of course the heat, and then sometimes we get a little rainy season in here, and although it's great for down on the bottom, when the rain hits the snows up there, it makes it really come down a lot quicker than it should. You know, that's the significance of the land grant. We are still in a fight over at least 80,000 uh, acres of that land grant, but we also kept intact um, why we were given the Vega, why the waterway that comes down there was actually the namesake for this place. Because again, without that water that's coming down there, we would have not been able to stay here for that long. The second promise of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was the preservation of language. Language is very important to this place. Again, uh, you know, these places weren't called St. Francis and St. Louis and St. Acacius. They were named San Francisco, San Isidro, San Luis, San Acacio. Spanish is a very important language still to this area. Spanish was spoken 150 years prior to English being spoken in this particular area. And so when you think that it's not a non-native language, well, it's absolutely a native language to this area. It's an indigenous language to this area. Our language is a mix of Spanish. Some of that is very old Spanish. Uh, for instance, instead of acequia, we say sequia, which is actually Catalan. We use Aztec words still. And so although you can speak to just about anybody that speaks the language, they sometimes catch some of those things that are a little bit different and they'll ask about it. And we're, uh, those of us who made this our quest to know that, that background, you know, we'll tell them that those are the different influences. But you know, all of those influences, uh, and that's what's really, really special about our language here. And it has been preserved all that time. It hasn't changed. Unfortunately, that's one of the things to go away. And when my parents were uh, first going to school here, the church was the one that had the school and actually most precious blood um, parish, which is now Sangre de Cristo parish, had their own church, or I'm sorry, their own school here. The nuns were actually the ones that taught um, the classes. If you spoke Spanish, you were actually either wrapped on the hands or you were punished because they didn't want you speaking Spanish, they wanted you to speak English. So then that third part of the promise of the uh, Tree of Guadalupe Hidalgo was the preservation of culture. Uh, we have had to actually preserve our own culture because again, that identity crisis um, really needed us to dig in and, and hold on to uh, the cultural aspects of our area. 
There's a great story in the uh, in the Fort Garland Museum that's being told now, and a lot of our culture um, is even being revamped because we're learning a little bit more about our history. If you see some of the um, street art that's down in town, there are these incredible murals that are down there in town, and they will always tell the story of our Spanish and our Mexican, and it's just really important to make sure that those cultures are preserved. It is important for we, the people who are still here, to embrace all three of those cultures, to teach that, um, because a lot of that is oral history, and again, a lot of that wasn't even told because it really almost didn't fit a narrative at one time or another. All of those traditions, all those histories, I grew up doing, and those are the most important memories that I can think of. And our town will continue to be uh, La Plaza de San Luis del Rio Culebra, um, so that will never go away, even if that part was taken off of the uh, name San Luis. It's still there, it's still something that we believe in, and it's just something that'll never go away. The earliest settlements in in Colorado, actually, what we know now is now know as Colorado, um, were here in the San Luis Valley during the Mexican period. So prior to 1848, um, the area that we're on, the land that we're on, um, was was Mexico or Mexican territory. And actually, prior to that, this was the north, very northern edge of the Spanish, you know, colonial empire. And then, you know, even if we go back even farther, you know, the San Luis Valley is a space that's been important for generations. And so by the time um, you know, the Mexican period comes around. Mexico is interested in populating this area with more permanent residents and goes through this process of establishing land grants, and giving away, you know, land as, a, as an enticement for folks, particularly in what we now know as the northern part of um, New Mexico, maybe Taos area, Abiquiu, places like that, um, to maybe move, you know, their families or themselves up into this area. Um, so the earliest settlements in this area are, um, are really connected to that period. So places like San Luis, which is often recognized as the oldest community in Colorado, and many of the other villages along the Rio Culebra, um, you know, have their history in that area. Where we're at, at the Fort Garland, um, or in Fort Garland, um, is also, you know, somewhat connected to that history as well. So in 1848, at the conclusion of the Mexican-American War, uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, is signed, which really results in about 500,000 square miles of land um, exchanging hands from Mexico to the United States, including where we're at here in Costilla County um, and at Fort Garland, and including those those communities that were, um, you know, had previously had been settled under the Mexican. The fort was established in 1858. Ten years after that Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, you know, during American westward expansion, as a way to, um, you know, facilitate. Um, you know, Americans moving into this area. You know, the story that has been told for a long time is that the fort was established to protect settlers, you know, while America is moving, moving west into the space. So Fort Garland is actually the second military fort that was established in the San Luis Valley, actually six years before um, Fort Massachusetts was built. Uh, fort Massachusetts is six miles north uh, of present day, you know, Fort Garland. Um, and almost immediately after the fort was established, that location proved to be problematic for, for several different reasons. And the commanders there decided that they were going to need to move locations. At that point, um, construction started here at Fort Garland. And on June 24th, 1858 is when the soldiers moved from Fort Massachusetts to Fort Garland. Um, often when I'm talking with visitors to the museum, I share that, I remind people that Fort Garland is actually older than Colorado, right? Um, Colorado didn't become a territory until three years later in 1861. Colorado didn't become a state until I think 18 years later in 1876. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of history here um, in Fort Garland and in Costilla County and the San Luis Valley in general. And even just that idea of like what the fort represents as this first like real American presence in the area, I think is a reminder of um, you know, of the intersection that is the San Luis Valley. This is an area that, pe that people have traveled through for a long time. Uh, it's an area where people and cultures and languages and even geography um, has converged. 
Um, so Fort Garland, you know, because of the location, um, it's probably not a surprise that the fort is actually constructed of adobe. Um, you know, just like many of the buildings across the San Luis Valley, particularly a lot of the historic buildings, you know, even the soldiers uh, realized that, you know, natural resources were pretty sparse here, particularly in this part of, you know, the state. And so they had to use you know, what they had available and they had to use and draw on knowledge from people that have lived here. So as you walk the grounds of the fort today, you'll notice we've still got five of the original buildings to that 1858 time period. Um, those five buildings are constructed with adobe. Many of the adobe bricks, I imagine, at the foundation of these buildings, you know, are 164 year old <laughs> reminders, right, of um, that original, you know, construction. Of course, there's been like preservation, you know, over the years. There were, um, at, at the peak, you know, activity here at the fort, there were, you know, there, it's told that, it's said that there are 22 different structures. Um, but, you know, what you see today are, you know, are we're the primary living quarters. So the other structures are things like, um, you know, maybe the hospital, maybe the stables, uh, you know, maybe some of the storage facilities. Um, so what has been preserved by the community over the years has been the barracks. Uh, we have both the infantry barracks and a cavalry barracks that um, exist that are still remaining. Um, those were constructed to house over a hundred men or about a hundred men um, at its peak, which if you were to walk through today, um, you might say, well, how did they fit a hundred uh, men in here? But, you know, it was bunk beds, uh, two to a bed, head to toe, um, and really just, you know, cramming soldiers in, you know, making as much use of space as you could. Uh, there are images of when there were more soldiers um, nearby um, that, you know, often some would camp out as well um, around on the fort grounds. Um, and then the, there, the other three buildings that remain still are what we consider officer's row. So we're standing right now in the west officer's quarters, which is next to the commandant's quarters where the person who really was in command of the fort um, lived, and then there's the East Officer's Quarter. So off, in Officer's Row, you often had the officers, higher ranked individuals living here on site. Um, interestingly, often with their families, if they did have families. So um, a lot of people don't think about or imagine women and children associated with like historic military forts or even in the West in general, but the reality was um, at places like Fort Garland, families were here. As well, so it wouldn't have been uncommon for you know women to be on the grounds, for children to be playing, you know, on the grounds, and a lot of the archaeological work that some of the prior um, you know students and others have been uh, doing has uncovered a lot of things like children's toys or um, you know household items that would uh, signal um, you know domestic life taking place you know at the fort, and I think that's a story uh, that often people don't. That don't think about. With the enlisted um, soldiers, those living in the barracks, they weren't allowed to have family. They basically were on their own. Many were probably single. They were probably younger. Um, you know, because of the era that we're in, many of the soldiers that were here, even, um, you know, American soldiers who came from out east were immigrants themselves or, or directly descended of immigrant families. So there were multiple languages that um, soldiers spoke when they were here. And so it really made for a dynamic you know, day-to-day, -day, um, you know, experience, I imagine, you know, during the heyday, particularly when there were a lot of folks here. You know, the other piece um, that I was going to mention is that even though, um, well, even though the, the quarters were built for, you know, up to 100 men per, it wasn't often that there were a lot of soldiers here on site from day to day, right? They were out, um, you know, maybe participating in, um, you know, drills or excursions, maybe patrolling, you know, the region, maybe responding to issues outside of, you know, the, the immediate vicinity of the fort. So it wasn't too common where you had, you know, like hundreds of soldiers, you know, on site, you know, for days on end, you know, there was a lot of activity, people moving, you know, in and out. This was also a, like a holdover spot, you know, as soldiers maybe in other companies would move through the region. And so um, even though, you know, it appears today maybe to outsiders that we may be out, you know, on the outskirts or out on the frontier, you know, in some ways, and that was, you know, that was certainly true in the 1850s and 1860s, but it was also a hub of activity as well for people coming through the area. We're very, very proud of, of what our ancestors did uh, way back when, uh, and trying to figure out how we balance our new lives 
uh, so that uh, this is here for our next generation. And hopefully these type of uh, uh, these type of educational opportunities for people to understand why we're here and, and, and what we do, I feel is a very, very important part of uh, passing that on to another generation and making sure that uh, they have the pride uh, in this location that we have. Thank you.